Nil, e, Hasan Hoca'ya da linki atabilir misin? O da katılmak istiyor. E-mail mı gönderdin <gülüyor> son hocaya? Evet hocam. O da gelsin başlayalım. Uh, we are waiting for our dean, uh, Mr. Mushan, and we'll start. That's fine. Evet. E katılıyor şu anda hocam. Okay. You're waiting for whom? Uh, our dean, and he also... He's what's his name? What's, what's his name? Uh, his name is uh, Professor Dr. Hasan Bülent Kahraman. Ah, Dr. Kahraman. He's also with us now. Yes, that Kahraman yeah. means means hero. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, okay. uh, he is the dean of architecture. He is the dean of architecture, and he's also the vice rector of the university. Yeah, great. Uh, I think we can start. Uh, Hello everyone and thank you for joining us at Graduation Design Project Seminar. Uh, our chosen theme for this year's Graduation Design Project is uh, Student Center in our own campus, Işık University. Uh, we have invited the prominent Boston-based American-Iranian architect, Mr. Mushan Hadem, to give a speech about his experiences in large campus design projects and particularly Student Center. Uh, I would like to thank Mr. Mushan Hadem for kindly accepting our invitation and being with us today. Uh, let me explain shortly about his professional background. Mushan Hadem graduated from University of Illinois Department of Architecture and received his master's degree in city planning from Harvard University Graduate School of Design. He is the president and principal in charge of design at Boston Design Collaborative. His 40 years of professional experience include numerous award-winning projects in the United States and the Middle East. His career includes senior design leadership and principal positions with prominent US architectural practices, such as Perkins and Will in Chicago, Hyatt Associates in Boston and Anshin and Allen in San Francisco. He has designed significant projects including the new campuses of American University in Cairo, the Koch University in Istanbul, Ahan University in Karachi, and each were designed for 10,000 students enrollment and each are over 250,000 square meters. Also, he was involved in countless projects such as academic facilities, healthcare facilities, private residential buildings, resorts, hotels, and commercial buildings. 
research and advanced technology buildings, urban planning projects as the principal in charge and design director. It's a great pleasure and honor for us to host Mr. Hadem and hear about his design approach. Our seminar will take approximately an hour and 20 minutes for the Q&A session. Uh, I'd like to thank Mr. Moshan Hadem for being with us today. Um, and before we start the seminar, I give the word to our Dean and Vice Rector, Professor Hassan Bilant Karma. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Suk. Actually, uh, I welcome, of course, Mr. Hadem to our session as well. And we're well aware uh, of his name and his work because uh, at the time when I was involved in the uh, establishment of the Sabanji University, the other side, at the other side of the Bosphorus, uh, Koch University was under construction. And I was, of course, very curious about the construction of the campus, establishment of the campus, founding of the campus, and the I immediately asked about the architecture and uh, I learned that it was Mr. Hadem. Finally, we're here after more or less 20 to 25 years of, uh, you know, uh, knowing me, him in absence. It is of course a great pleasure and honor to have him uh, in our university. I hope one day when this great disaster of coronavirus epidemic is over, he will have the chance of traveling to Istanbul and uh, we will uh, have the pleasure of uh, hosting him in our campus and uh, hear about his criticism. And I'll try to see if those criticisms go in the same line with my criticism about the campus because uh, I'm not an old one in the campus. I just came a year ago and uh, you know the newcomers always are more critical about, uh, 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 more critical than the others who have already settled in uh, anywhere finally once again mr adam uh, welcome to shik university session and i congratulate all who have uh, spent their efforts in the organization of this seminar and uh, we we'll look forward to hearing your uh, talk thank you very much So, oh, Mr. Hadam, it's your turn to, you can start your seminar, please. Is this my turn to say something? Yeah, Arif? yeah please. Okay. I don't see the paper. Uh, uh, let's not, let me just say some, a few things. Uh, um, uh, thank you very much, Alef Hanum, and thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kahraman, uh, for having invited me to this uh, wonderful seminar. Uh, it's always a pleasure for me to be back in Turkey, in Istanbul, even if it is online uh, and by Zoom. I consider that country my second country. I am very attached to, uh, to Turkey, to Istanbul, and all, to all my wonderful Turkish friends. Uh, I have traveled hundreds of times there, and I have wonderful memories of your beautiful, wonderful country. Uh, with your permission, uh, Alef Hanum, uh, Dr. Gahraman, I would start my presentation, and I also like to thank all of the wonderful uh, senior students in architecture for participating in the seminar, and I am going to give you my view and understanding of architecture and what design is all about and what student center should be about. It's my views. Uh, everybody has a different way of looking at architecture. This is my special way of looking at architecture, which has informed the whole body of my work from small scale to large scale. And I hope by this dialogue with you, I can become enriched from your experience and your insight. Those of you who are, who are older 
can give me your experience. Those of you who are younger can share with me your enthusiasm, which can fire up my imagination again. But before I start talking, I want to ask your wonderful architectural students, what is their definition of architecture? Because every profession has a definition. And from the beginning, when I started studying architecture, I was, I was amazed by the fact that there is not a very good uh, understanding and comprehension of what architecture means. Can I ask one of your wonderful students to offer me, or a few of them, what they think, they, they think architecture is? So I'm going to wait, and I like to see their beautiful faces and see who is going to venture to respond to me. It can be more than one response. Somebody, please. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, can I? Hi. Uh, excuse, can I? Me, excuse me. One can I, idea? I have to make sure that. Okay. All right. Who is who is venturing to give me an answer? Uh, me. Yes. I go think, ahead, please. Uh, I think architecture is the art of creating spaces. The art of creating spaces. I'm going to write this. Okay, anybody else? Can I? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Can I see your uh, face? I opened my camera actually. <laughs> I can. Oh, yes, please. Uh, architecture is a very special thing, uh, it is a creating a space. It can be uh, for humans or other uh, living creatures. And as my friends say, I think it is an uh, art of uh, doing, art of making uh, space. And um, for example, uh, it's not about a building actually, it's uh, creating a space uh, using this space more efficiently and yeah it, it's a little bit complicated i'm so excited right now i'm sorry but i think it's an art uh, i can say that so you're both saying it's the art of creating spaces any other any other person who wants to venture an opinion hello yes welcome can you see me I can see you, can yes. See. Okay, so uh, my opinion is architecture is uh, the manipulation of our perception of space. So it can also be a science and uh, we, we can also produce some art by using architecture, but it's all about the perception. So, say that again, uh, architecture is what? Give me in one sentence. One sentence. Okay, so no, okay. it's uh, the manip manifestation of what? Manipulation uh, of manipulation of perception of uh, the space. Manifestation so of our, what space? No, no, it is not manifestation. It is manipulation of the perceptions yes. about the space. Manipulation yes, of perception right. of space. So we organize it. Uh, or organizing space, right? I think okay. she's more saying the organization of the perception of the space. Organization of perception of the space. Okay. Anybody else? Before I give you what I think architecture is. I can something. Yes. Um, uh, I think architecture is uh, to co connect uh, between uh, all living things uh, and environment with art and technology. Connect what? Connect. To connect with uh, between all living things and environment with art and technology. All living things 
with art and technology. Yeah. Okay, are you ready to get my answer to this question, this basic question? <clears throat> Shall I proceed? Uh, no, let me see the beautiful faces of people. I don't want these images, please. Uh, I believe uh, the definition I give to you uh, relates to everything. Before talking, I have to tell you that I am a devout uh, uh, believer in the writings of Mevlana Jalaluddin Rumi which is uh, your country boasts, it, it came from Balkh, Afghanistan and Iran, and he stayed in your country and produced the most magnificent volume of uh, insight and philosophy into everything, including architecture. Every physical phenomenon is, uh, conveys a meaning. Behind it, there is a meaning. That starts even with what I'm telling you. Words uh, convey a meaning. The meaning is in your mind. So a um, natural phenomenon conveys a meaning. So there are two things in this world. There is an appearance and the meaning behind it. And when I say physical, every, every phenomenon in the world, uh, all the phenomena in the world are the appear appearances of a meaning, including my words. My words are the skin of a living thought. The thought is in my mind. That is the meaning. That is why Mevlana says, would it be that I destroy sound, syllable, and words so that, so that I can communicate with you? The communication is the thought that's in your mind and you need the skin of words to communicate it. But the moment you use the skin, that idea in your mind becomes less than it is. How often have you said, I want to say something to you, but I don't know how to put it into words. So I'm starting with words so that you understand the, the, the depth behind the thought I'm conveying to you. This definition, of appearances, phenomena actually means appearance of the reality that is behind things is the architecture of that thing. The architecture of my thought are the words that I utter to you. So <clears throat> my definition of architecture, since I was young, this occurred to me and I started working on it and developing it. Uh, I give you the definition. I wrote it here so that I am. Architecture is the outward or physical expression of the realities that exists in, in a phenomenon, natural or physical or anything. Even a scientist who gives, uh, formulates a scientific theory there is the idea behind it. What is important is the idea. It's the skin. It is not the appearance. For example, in, in nature, please show the image of the tree. What is the shape of a tree is the architecture of the tree. But this, this physical shape of the tree, what does it convey? It conveys to you the potentialities that existed in the reality of it, which is the seed. And the seed was subjected to the earth and it was uh, the sun and the wind and everything. And finally it produces this magnificent structure of the tree, which every member of it is related to the other member. It is a continuous element. It's not segmented or separated. It's the whole thing not only it conveys all its growth and development from its seedhood to its maturity of the form, exterior form, which is the architecture of it, it also anticipates its future. This is now uh, 
winter. But when you look at it, if you look at it with perceptive eyes, you don't see only its past that grew out from the seed, but it see its its magnificent future. It is heralding the coming of the of the spring, and the flowers and all of the fresh stuff that's going to grow on it. So every phenomenon not only conveys its past, but also anticipates its future. At every moment in time, and every moment in time is precious because every moment of time is filled with, with all of the past as well as all the future expectation. So time is the most important and the most mystical things that we experience in this life. Can I see the next one, please? Gian Bologna at the Uffizi Gallery, if you go there, uh, these uh, Italian Renaissance artists and architects understood this concept, I think, very well. He has this beautiful nude uh, that you see when, before you enter the museum of the Uffizi Gallery in the, uh, in the loggia in front of it, there is this beautiful nude. Do you know what Gian Bologna has named this nude? Let me see the beautiful face of the audience and see if anybody knows. He called it architecture. So our bodies are the architecture of our inner realities. The, our inner reality is inherited from thousands of years of history. And I don't want to go into the complication of that, but every one of us is endued with a magnificent past. We are the presence of the past. Our existence is the presence of the past, but also it is anticipating the future wonderful developments in our own thoughts and minds. And each one of us are given, uh, are endowed with spiritual, intellectual, physical qualities. And in this life, we have to satisfy to the very end. And that's the purpose of our lives to achieve our perfection. Uh, okay, having said that, is that clear what I think architecture is? So therefore, what is important for architecture is to convey the inner realities that exist in it. When, you, when we say architecture is manipulation of space or creating something, in my opinion, that is a misrepresentation because you don't create anything except the figment of your imagination. And this is why architecture is faced with such a dilemma in the modern world, because everybody wants to create something and something in a sensationalist world and the sensationalist media that attracts attention. So architecture becomes sensationalist statement on the part of the architect and on the part of the builder who wants to make a statement to his ego and his self-centeredness. That is why we have the mess that is urban cities in the world. But if you take a different look at it and say, no, as architects, we don't create. As scientists, we don't create. As artists, we don't create. As, as uh, uh, literary figures we don't create. What we do is discover because the inner realities of everything exists. To create something from nothing is only uh, assigned to the divine. And I don't want to get into that discussion right now. But what we do, what we have to do as architects is discover what is laid in the inner realities of what is the inner realities of things and what are the relationship of its component parts in the real inner reality. We will never understand the real, real reality of anything in this world. We just see the appearances. However, we have to get a glimpse of it. And if we as great architects, as great artists, are able to convey that inner reality of something, not with a thick skin of ideas, I can, I can use a lot of complicated words to you to convey my thought. My words are the skin of my thought. And if I use a lot of complicated words, I would make the skin so thick that you wouldn't understand what I'm saying. The same thing is true about architecture. If we make the design a, an expression of our ego and make it so thick, the idea doesn't shine through it. 
my definition of masterpieces of art, architecture, and literature is that the artist, the architect, the writer, uh, and even the scientist is so skilled that he can he can convey the idea and make the skin so thin, so thin that the idea shines through it. Like when you go to St. Peter's and you see La Pieta by Michelangelo, he has made the skin so thin that you understand the idea or you can't convey the idea, but it hits you in your heart. When I went, when I was young, I was 22 years old. I went to the church of Santa Maria Novella in Florence and I saw the such the picture of the painting of Masaccio, the Trinity. I was young and I'm not a Christian and without any control over myself, I sat down and cried. So you see the test of a great masterpiece is that it so moves you that brings tears to your eyes, but these are not the tears of sadness. These are the tears of joy because you are confronted with beauty and really the purpose of all of us to make this beauty manifest to the world. Artists, architects, literary. Why do we get so moved by reading Mevlana Jalaluddin or a great novel? Because that writer is so skilled that makes the skin so thin. So masterpieces, it means to me, the shining through of the idea through the skin. Having said this background, and I can talk for a long time about it. In fact, I have done on many lectures. I want to go back directly to our main topic, which is uh, uh, architecture. Okay, can I see? There are two ways to, oh, okay. Did you see the image of the tree and the image of human body? Do you see how all parts are interconnected and, and, and they are nothing separated from each other? Unfortunately, including myself in schools, the first thing we are taught when we are given a, an architectural problem, an architectural project, we are given a program and we are told, we are told to dissect it. We take the program and see, separate it into parts. We say how the relationships should be and what should relate to another. Uh, we develop, a we are so focused on function that we forget about the idea completely. And consequently, we have divided a magnificent program into so many parts. Once you divide it, you can't put them together. Think of the tree and the human body. If you separate its parts, you can't put them together again. You have to think in a very holistic way. How do we do this? Can I have uh, Neil Hanum the next slide, please? After that, next slide. Okay, let me see, let me show you this. This is a diagrammatic expression of what I conveyed so far. So on one end, on the realm of, of the ethereal realm, I am putting the truth. The truth is the idea of, uh, of a phenomenon. That's the truth, the idea behind it which we can never really totally understand, but we can get glimpses of it. That idea has to become, uh, has to have a physical expression, you know, which was like the human body or the tree. And we have to search for that. We don't create that. We have to search for that idea. If they give you the university or they give you the student center, you have to search about the beautiful idea that's behind it. And then you have to, uh, in the process of search, uh, uh, you have to give it personalization. You have to personify it. You have to make it appear in the physical realm, in the material realm. And in search of truth, on one side you have truth, which is the idea, and the other side you have the, uh, the physical expression of it. In search of it, what do you find is beauty. John Keats, an English poet says, uh, beauty is truth, truth is beauty. That's all you know in this world and that's all you need to know. If we understand the meaning of beauty in this world, we have satisfied our life's desire. The agent is architect and the method is search, but the vehicle is design. I just want to emphasize this. Please, dear students, don't think design is the ultimate goal. 
When you think design is the ultimate goal, you fall into the trap of creating your idiosyncrasies and uh, uh, an owner wants to build and make a design that's sensational and pronounce to the world that here I am, the, the richest man in the world and so on and so forth. Now design, which is the vocabulary of proportions of colors, etc., is just a vehicle. That design has to become so transparent that the idea shines from behind it. Um, that's what I want to convey in this uh, diagram, uh, which really is the summary of what I have talked about so far. Let's go back. Next one. Okay. How do we do uh, architecture? I call it continuous architecture, uh, as opposed to uh, architecture that is separated. And by continuous, I mean continuous in space. Architecture has to be continuous in space. It's physical appearance. Hold on here, please. Hold on. The second part is that it, the second aspect, it should be continuous in time. I mentioned to you, every work of art or architecture or, uh, or science or uh, literary work is, a mo is a, at a point in time. At that point in time, it carries all of its past, but it anticipates all of its future. So it's continuous in space and continuous in time. It has to be also uh, completely integrated with the nature where it is. So it has to be continuous with nature. If a piece of architecture imposes itself on nature and wants to, uh, to show pride over nature, that is, failure of architecture. It has to enhance nature and it has to be always subserv subservient to nature uh, because nature is what is really the holy part of, the, of, of all of it. Okay, next, next one, please. Now, consider this uh, as the program of architecture. They give you, they tell you to design something and it's, it's composed of a program. I can, I'm showing these programs in the form of some blocks. Now, we can organize this in many ways. We can organize it as separate buildings, objects. And then we have these towers in Chicago. And then I have the next one that I showed to you. I went to Israel to where Jesus Christ gave the Sermon of the Mount. And I was appalled to see that holy spot was uh, uh, littered by this kind of uh, uh, discontinuous architecture. Okay, next one. Now, you can take the same, block, the same blocks and organize it around the individual. The, the, hold on, hold on, please. The, quali the qualities of an object in space is, is that it has to be built and it has, uh, the observer has to stand away from it and observe it from a distance and become overwhelmed by it. It needs distance, it's exploits, it's, it exploits space. Uh, and then when there are too many of these egocentric architectures, uh, you have a lot of these towers next to each other, rather than giving space to be seen, uh, the space or, or at, uh, at, at least be landscape, the space is filled with cars and traffic and you have the mess that's urban America, urban uh, Istanbul, uh, etc. But the other way is uh, that uh, the architecture doesn't become the object of your adoration. It's the man that becomes the object of adoration. It's a space in which there is a man and he sees around it. Architecture encloses him. The next one. And then you connect these things to each other by entrance portals. That's why in this architecture entrances become very important. And they connect all of them together and you have a system, a hierarchical system of spaces where life occurs. This produces a continuous, continuous architecture and it produces, uh, 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 becomes, the place where human life occurs, where all of these spaces where, human, uh, where humans live and interact and uh, have a sense of community and privacy. Uh, from since I was young, this became the motto of how I would design my architecture. And believe me, I learned more from the writings of 
uh, our shared culture, the great poets and the great writers of our shared culture and the great monuments in our shared culture, both Istanbul, both Tur Turkey and Iran to come, uh, to come to this conclusion that that's what should uh, signify my architecture. Go ahead, please. Now, I would like to discuss the latest project I worked on uh, to convey to you how we do this kind of architecture. Uh, uh, hold on, please, don't move anymore. Um, uh, this kind of architecture, it's very difficult to do and most offices don't do it because it takes a lot of time and effort. And also because we are not, not taught in schools to do this kind of architecture. Uh, uh, the first thing that I do with this kind of architecture is that I take the body of the program that is given to me by the programmer, in this case, academic programmer, which consists of 80 buildings or 90 different separated buildings uh, for 200, uh, 2 million square feet or 200,000 square meters or most of them that I have designed now, they are about 300, thousand square meters. What I would do, I deconstruct, the first thing we do, I deconstruct them. And go back now to the next image. Now, the first thing I do, not de deconstruct them, the first thing I do, I tell my design team, go and search the morphic field of architecture in that area. Because if we are true to the statement we made that architecture should convey the inner realities of an idea. The inner reality of the university, Koç University in Turkey is different from the inner reality of the university, American University in Cairo or the Aukhan University or any other project. We have to look for, to understand what that is. We have to tread a path of discovery. Uh, so that every piece of architecture we do does not carry our signature or that particular uh, rich client's signature. It has to carry the signature of the area and of the user. It has to make a statement that that culture and that uh, user we are designing for is beautiful. Uh, unfortunately, today, a lot of architects from America and Europe design things without giving attention to this background and they it's for New York done it's a building that should be in New York or in Texas or somewhere and they put it in the middle of Saudi Arabia or in the middle of India uh, they are actually it's an affront to that culture what you are saying you are not saying your culture is beautiful you're saying my culture is beautiful and I'm superimposing it on you so therefore I ask my design team always with the American University in Cairo, I told them search for the morphic field and they have to go and find all the historic uh, uh, buildings of that area and areas that are related to it and the streets. These are all from, is from Cairo uh, and, uh, and understand what the, what the morphic field of art and architecture is. I even tell them familiarize yourself with the history and with the, stop it please. Uh, with the history and with the music, with their poetry and everything to the extent that you can. I even told my design team at the American University in Cairo, if anybody on this project talks about um, the Campidelio in Rome or talks about Piazza San Marco in Venice is out of the team. All of the references should be the culture to the, to the, to the um, art, history of architecture, uh, music, and what is relevant to this culture. Because we want to say to people who come to the American University in Cairo that uh, um, Egypt and Cairo is beautiful and they should be proud of their culture. All right, so what I did, they gathered all of these things. They gathered for me all of the open spaces of great uh, monuments in uh, Cairo, Ibn Tulun, the mausoleum of Sultan Hassan, the Cairo One Mosque, which is in Tunisia, but it has different influence on Egypt, uh, Maidan Shah of Isfahan and things in Istanbul. And I told them, I, before you do anything, I want a collage of all of these things. We must have made 10 different collages. 
and I looked at this. These are the collages of important public spaces in that culture. And I looked at this and I said, this works. Because what I want to do, this is going to be a student for 10,000 uh, students. This is a university for 10,000 student enrollment. It is like a small town. And in a small town, what happens? There are spaces for interaction. There are spaces for privacy. There are spaces for isolation. There are spaces to, for enjoyment of nature. And I said, the main space of this building has to be a space for interaction, a huge maidan where thousands of students and faculty get together. And the essence of a university is interchange of ideas. And by interchange of ideas, new ideas would develop. Uh, and new theories would develop. So this, that particular collage uh, led me to believe to develop a big space in the middle in which thousands of people can gather. You see the cursor. And I put the library in front. The library is the only separated element because at that time, the librarians did not want people to get out of their library uh, without a book, they wanted to control it. So both in the case of Coach and American University in Cairo, I made it a separate element, which is in front, as you see. Could you put your cursor on it? And then, uh, uh, and then there are uh, uh, there are a, lot, a number of spaces and a number of places for movement. So we uh, separate spaces for interaction, spaces for movement, spaces for introspection, spaces for isolation, spaces for enjoyment of nature. And we put all of it together in a, a form that the initial concept was this. I have to tell you, when I was designing the American University, when I was designing Coach University, American University in Cairo wanted to, re to change its location to 30 miles out of Cairo, because I think at that time they anticipated all the unrest and uh, problems that occurred after that. This They told this about us in the year, year 2000. And they came to me and I said, look, my office is not big and this project is very big. And they said they had listed 60 architects, uh, international arch architects to participate in this. And I didn't want to do it because doing a competition is very, very expensive. It can cost you up to $500,000. So I kind of declined, but I said, I have to look at it. Then they came back to me after several months and they said, we have reduced it to uh, 25. And I still was a little hesitant. And they said they reduced it to 12. We are still on the, on the list. That was of course a great compliment to us because they had seen what we were doing at Coach University. Uh, so they sent, they said, all right, send a brief of uh, your architectural design philosophy. And everything I told you today, I wrote in a five page brief and sent it to them. After a couple of a few months, they came back and they said, they have reduced the number of people they are inviting, architects they are inviting to six. And this is how they want the, the university to be designed. When I looked at the brief they sent me, I noticed that three and a half pages of that brief is verbatim what I had written to them. And I got an inkling that we are, I'm going to win that competition because I don't think other architects would look at architecture like this as, as a continuous system of buildings. They would probably design 80 different buildings separated from each other. I said, okay, we accept it. And I accepted it. And the result was this kind of design that we started developing that I'm showing to you. And we won the competition. It was a very difficult international competition with very, very prominent firms in the world involved. Um, so this was the model that I presented. And I sent this to them as the result of our competition. As you see, this model, hold on here, please. Uh, uh, Neil Hanum, the, the next one, please, the next one. And then uh, put your uh, cursor on the entry. So what we did, we developed an entry portal and an entry space for people who come to the campus. And you go through that main portal. I mentioned to you the distinguishing factor 
of this kind of architecture are the, are the portals and the special events that happen here. So it's not the architecture of 80 different buildings. It's a continuous architecture with a welcoming space that you enter and then a movement space that you go beyond it. It connects this entrance to the first courtyard. Put your cursor on it. No, the, between that and that, they all see this. See, look at see that movement. There is a street that goes. That's the movement that goes to um, one of the courtyards, and they all lead into each other until it gets to the main courtyard, which is in the middle, as you see. And in this main courtyard, uh, I think uh, I calculated 5,000 people can gather. Uh, so now we have a system of spaces. So in this kind of architecture, what becomes important is void, not solids. And by the virtue of the fact that it's continuous, it's compact. Uh, I, don't, I don't think you can go to any campus uh, that I know of, that from one extreme of it to the other extreme, you can walk in 10 minutes. Uh, cars are completely banned in this area. The other beauty of this kind of architecture is that it can remain intact. When you design a campus, you go there after five, six years, and you have a lot of separated buildings, other architects add things to it on the sides, and you go there and the integrity of design is lost. The designs that I have given, it cannot be compromised over time. You can add to it in its exterior, but also there is an inbuilt flexibility inside because every module we are building on modules of four meter by four meter, one four meter by four meter is a classroom, is it an office, two is a seminar, four is a small classroom, eight is a bigger classroom, laboratories and so on. So as the university contracts and expands, a lot of departments contract and expand the department that expands can move into the areas that it has contracted. So there is an inside flexibility in there too. There is no, in this kind of architecture, there is no distinction between school of engineering, school of medicine, school of law, school of humanities, school of sciences. They are all together one and the same. In fact, at the university, Coach University, when they wanted to start the law department, the dean of the law school said, I want my own building. And I said, it's not possible. Just choose a part in this continuum and we'll, uh, that will be the law school. Um, so um, uh, having said that, I, let's, let's see. Uh, uh, you, you understand how now, unfortunately, after we won the competition, a person was chosen to direct this on the part of university who was very political. This university was a very, very political animal. Uh, and the main architect of Egypt uh, who had associated with Sasaki Associates in Boston and they wanted to the project. They thought they, it, it was owed to them. And he had given the PhD to the a guy who had become the in charge of the project. Uh, gradually, uh, this guy wanted to uh, replace us and started bringing him to our seminars and to our meetings and to our progress meetings. And finally, uh, I got so upset that we uh, gave the concept and the initial design and the rest of the project was uh, divided by a lot of architects because I refused to continue. So the architecture of the interior walls of the courtyard is uh, compromised. It's, it's our idea, but it has been compromised by other architects. Let me see the other one, please. And this is the, the park in front of it, of the American University in Cairo. So uh, what we did, no, 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 go back, go back, go back. What, go back again, go back again. Go back, go back, go back, back. Okay, so what we did, we took the 80 buildings that I said, the first thing was to prepare the morphic field of architecture. That's the background, artistic, uh, uh, architectural and everything that gives us an idea of what that culture and the inner realities of that project is all about. So the next thing is that we took the 80 books of 90 books of the programmer 
and I knew the programmer. We had introduced the programmer. It's a great programmer, but they are used in developing separate buildings. Uh, I told my design team to deconstruct it. And we took all of the spaces from all of the program of different colleges, uh, like big classrooms, lecture rooms, uh, etc., that uh, required a lot of people. And then the smaller classrooms, uh, uh, and the student center, which is a subject of a discussion, we deconstructed that too. And we put all of the uh, traffic generating elements like the big classrooms around this central space. Uh, uh, Neil Hanum pointed the central space. Around the central space, at one end of the central space, we put some of the functions of the student center. At the other end, some of the other functions like places where you eat or places where you buy things. And we uh, separated the function of the student center around this so that uh, it would generate more, more traffic. It would not be concentrated in one place. As I mentioned, the only thing that was separated was the library we put in the middle of it. As, as uh, if you put the cursor, you will see. And of course, uh, the, uh, the park in front of it. Now, I want to mention to you, Sullivan, the American 19th century architect, did the disservice. He came up with the phrase of form follows function, which is true in some cases, but not in all cases. And I would encourage you, dear students, not to take this so literally, because form always doesn't follow function. A lot of times, form evokes function. And certainly, for the um, uh, for the laboratories, which is composed in uh, is in one of the courtyards that gener is generated from this main space in American University in Cairo uh, because of the specific requirements of hood uh, uh, and chemistry uh, uh, the laboratory and other laboratories, they are function specific. You have to respect them, but you don't have to respect all aspects of a program because the function changes in them. Even in the laboratories, it changes. But to some extent, you have to respect the function specificity of things like laboratory, of operating theaters in hospital. And I have designed a lot of hospital. But with other, uh, with regard to other things, um, you can design things that you think is appropriate, and it will find its own function. Um, so we reorganized. Then we, after deconstructing the program of 80 buildings, we reconstructed putting them around the spaces. So the architecture beca became void specific, not solid specific. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, now let me talk to you about Coach University. Uh, <coughs> we were invited in a design competition again not this time between 60 firms and six firms, which was result in the resulting number of firms at the American University in Cairo, but three prominent firms uh, in Boston and England. And I was hesitant to accept it because again, it's a very expensive proposition to come up with a design solution before you're commissioned. Of course, the client was giving some earnest money at the beginning. So I kind of said, well, I have to meet the client. And I was told that, yes, the client wants to meet you. So the client organized a series of the meetings between the three architects. And I went there. When I went there, I went and saw the site. And I must tell you, when I saw this magnificent view of the Bosphorus, I was moved. I was really so moved when I saw it because I was standing in Europe and I was looking at Asia and beyond it, my, I saw my homeland. Um, and I always thought Bosphorus was a very magical space in the geography of the world. And then when I was looking at that, immediately a poem came to my mind from Mevlana. And I want to mention this experience, which was a very moving, almost a spiritual experience. 
so that you understand what I thought the idea behind Coach University should be and how I should be humble enough to express this idea to the best of my ability. And you are among the people who see this and tell me whether I, I succeeded in that or not. The, the thing was this, when I saw this, I remember this story in Mevlana's Masnavi. And those of you who have read it, you probably know better than I. A merchant wanted to go to India. In those days, merchants would go to India. They wouldn't come to America or Europe. And he uh, asked the, his household members, what do you want me to bring back to you as a souvenir? And everybody asked for something. He had a parrot in the cage. The parrot said to him, don't you want to ask me? Yes, he said, yes, what do you want me to bring you from my trip to India? The parrot said, I don't want anything except when you are there because the legend says that parrots come from India. When you are there and you see a parrot flying in the sky, tell the parrot in the sky that your friend in my house said, why am I in the cage and you are flying? So the merchant goes to India and sees this parrot and says that to the parrot. And the parrot immediately drops dead. When he comes back, he gives a souvenir to the other members of the family. And the parrot says, Did you, where is my souvenir? And the merchant was hesitant to tell him because you know the parrot died. But he says, yes, I said, I gave your message and the parrot dropped and died. The moment he says that the parrot in his cage drops dead. The merchant was very upset. He takes the parrot to bury it outside. And some of the most magnificent lines of Masnavi is regarding the lamentation of the merchant over the death of this parrot. We don't have time, otherwise I would recite them to you. And then the parrot falls and dies. He takes the parrot out to bury it. And the moment he opens the cage and takes the parrot out, the parrot flies away. And Rumi says, the parrot winged its flight so high and flew away like the sun rushing into Turkey land. This, the, uh, the sun, like unto the sun of the Orient running unto Turkey land. That was the flight, he describes the flight of the, of the parrot. Immediately I thought to my mind, this, this verse refers to the profound concept of the Orient of light that is replete in your traditional literature and in my traditional literature. And this Orient of light was the concept that was brought by Goethe to the European culture, uh, ex oriente lux. And I said, my God, the symbol of this university and the, the idea behind this university should be the concept of the Orient of light. But the Orient of light means that the light of knowledge and understanding comes from the East, from the Orient and sets in the West, the Occident. And this idea is very consistent with the ideas of the philosopher Sohre Vardi, who uh, brought forth the uh, philosophy of illumination to our both cultures. Uh, the, uh, now, the Orient and Occident is not geographic Orient and Occident. It is a, a, a a conceptual orient of Ox uh, Occident, that all knowledge like the sun that shines from the sky, shines in the sky, sh comes from, from the Orient and sets in the Occident. And that was a fantastic image for the university for Turkey, because uh, in Turkey, all knowledge before the Renaissance came from East and went to the West. And after the Renaissance, it came from the west and came to the east and Turkey was a gate. So I thought that would be a fantastic symbol of the idea behind, would be a fantastic symbol for the idea behind the uh, architecture of Coach University. University as the portal of knowledge, a university as the transfer of ideas and of uh, facilitating the travel of knowledge 
from one area to another within Turkey and uh, throughout the world at large. So immediately I thought the image of the university, the icon for Coach University should not be a, a sensational piece of architecture. It should be a void, a portal, uh, the portal of light uh, looking at the east, at the rising sun. So therefore, uh, uh, the rising sun became the most important physical symbol of the intellectual idea of the rise of the intellectual thought from the East, from the Orient of light. Okay, and then uh, I went to see Mr. Rami Koch. Uh, he gave me 10 minutes to see him and he asked me what I thought and I told all of this and I recited all of the poetry to him. And then our meeting lasted rather than 10 minutes, close to an hour. And the guy who was taking, who had taken me to see Mr. Coach, Mr. Tamar Shahinbash later on said, Mujan, I'm surprised. All you did, you said a bunch of poetry to him. The other architects talk, talked about method of construction. And I said, doesn't matter. I'm going to do this design because I knew that um, the Coach family is very receptive to this kind of architecture. Okay, let's see the next one. This is the site. We go through this quickly because, ah, the first thing I did, I sent somebody to take a picture of the rising sun over Bosphorus from the, that particular location uh, where the university was supposed to be built. Uh, the guy was almost arrested because that was a military land and he had to go at five o'clock in the morning to catch the rising sun. But he sent that to me and that became the introduction to my presentation to the coach family. Yes, go ahead. Yes, next. Ah, oh, well, this should have come later, but anyway. Yeah, this is this is the portal of light that leads to that Maidan. And is it's all about the rising sun. The university is all about the rising sun, and they called it the portal of knowledge. The rising sun of knowledge. Yes, next one. When I went to present our project to the client, I went, these things were not even on the model. The model was completely bare. The other architects had presented the client, uh, took the client to the room with a lot of drawings on the walls and so on, explaining everything. I came to the room with just a bare model. And then I said, I took these things and put it there. I said, I don't want anybody to see the image of the Bosphorus. I put the road there. Uh, to come from a place that you would not see the image, to come to the strategic point on the uh, campus, on the site where that uh, circle is, and in front of it is the portal of light. Please point to the portal of light. And then I said, the front of that is going to be a big maidan, um, a coach maidan, oriented to the sun, to the rising sun. In front of it, not, there should be nothing except the glory of the rising sun, symbolizing the sun of knowledge. And on the right should be the academic buildings. Could you show the next one? The blue is the academic building. The uh, purple on the top is the student housing. The, the light blue is all parking. The brown on top is uh, faculty housing and the blue on the very top is the sports facilities. And then I connected the coach made on to a walk that goes along the academic buildings and each academic, uh, continuous academic build, uh, courtyard, we don't call them buildings, each courtyard has a mini portal to the rising sun that I would show to you later. To remind people always that the focus, the idea behind this design is the rising sun. Architecture is subservient to the, to the rising sun, the physical sun, as the symbol of the intellectual sun. Yes? So this became uh, what I finally presented to the client. Uh, based on the morphic field of design, it recalls the Ottoman, has a memory of its Ottoman past uh, uh, without copying it. Uh, 
not the only Ottoman, but I would mention to you of a lot of historic things in Turkey. Yes, go ahead. And then the site changed because they couldn't get this site. It moved a little bit and the form of the design changed. Uh, <coughs> let's go back again. Next one, next one. No, next one, yes. The form of the design changed to this shape because uh, where they allocated the land finally to the university, there were a lot of trees and we didn't want to, to cut trees. So it became kind of like an S shape, not uh, change the form, but the concept remains the same. Okay, let's go more, more, further. Okay, this shows the, arch the con continuous architecture I talked about, everything connected together. Yes, more. Next one, next one. And this is the portal of light. This is the first thing you see when you come to the university. And you see the coach made on and uh, uh, let, let's, let me see, see the other one. I, I want to mention something. The, the floor of this, uh, you know, I mentioned to you that uh, the other thing that I like you dear students to avoid is this idea of less is more. Less is more was coined by uh, Miss Van der Rohe in Chicago or maybe before him. But uh, a lot of times less is only less, you know, uh, because the less and more Miss Van der Rohe talks about in his magnificent glass structures, he goes through a lot of trouble to get to that less. He goes to a lot of more to get to that less. If you know the way he detailed his building, you see how, how cumbersome it was for him to get to convey that idea of less. But at any rate, the less is more abandoned, banned all kinds of surface treatment from modern architecture. In the past, architecture housed sculpture, paintings, and everything. Ever since this movement of less is more, all of the paintings, sculptures, everything in the world, they are wandering and looking for a place to be seen. Now, at Coach University, we didn't do that. The ceiling of the portal of light is gilded by this um, gilded image of the two nine-sided stars. Uh, for me, I mean, I interpreted this as uh, referring to Dante's Divine Comedy because Dante's Divine Comedy was the beginning of the change of knowledge coming, beginning of Renaissance, knowledge coming from the West to the East. Before that was from East to the West. And this shows the nine levels, 18 levels. Uh, and the, the middle is, uh, uh, it's where how, Dante goes to levels of hell, heaven, purgatory uh, with his guide Virgil as the personification of uh, uh, reason. And then Virgil at the end says, I can't take you to the last stage. You have to go that with that with Beatrice because that is the reign of love. Uh, I don't want to talk much about this, but you have to know that Dante's Divine Comedy was based in our tradition of uh, Mehraj, going to heaven, uh, going from, from Zoroastrian times to Muslim times, and it, was, it influenced Dante according to the scholarship that is, exists in the Vatican. If you want to know more about that, read Anna Marie Shimon's book, Mystical Dimensions of Islam, and you will see the documentation that the Vatican scholars say that he took the idea from our part of the world, okay? The next one. Um, the student center is the building to your right. And I would talk more about that. Again, do you see all of these steps that are here? This was not part of the program. I put it in there. It's a vast space with a lot of steps and a green space in front of it. And the client told me this is not in the program. I said, I want it, it will find its own function. And lo and behold, now it has found its own function. All the graduation ceremonies are held on this grass space. And then people frequent, if you go there to Coach University, hundreds of people are sitting on these steps and are having a lot of fun and watching Frisbees and sports and so on. So this is in a case of form evokes function. I have another example I'll show you later. 
And you see the portal of light right now leading to the coach Maidan. After the graduation ceremonies, people go up these stairs and go to the coach Maidan. It, coach Maidan can accommodate thousands of people. Yes, next one. This is the coach Maidan, it's empty right now. The portal of light, the coach Maidan, go ahead. Now this is the courtyard, as I said, no, no building is built uh, according to any discipline. This is the courtyard, the courtyards are named. This is the courtyard of the School of Business Administration. And that's the statue of Vehbi Bey, who is the father of the coach family, uh, the founder of the coach family. And they wanted his statue and I uh, uh, caused them to hire uh, Lloyd Lilly, who recently died, a famous Boston sculptor who made the sculpture of uh, Baby Bay, who is sitting there as the uh, great businessman in his business courtyard. Yes, next one. These are different courtyards. That's good. Uh, continuous architecture. Now, around the courtyards and the pools, uh, reflecting pools, I asked that I wanted. Uh, the memory, the memory of the past of Turkey, these inlaid mosaic work with uh, certain kinds of design so that people walking through it, they remember the beauty of their culture. Yes. Like this, you know, first they told me if you hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, yeah, they told me if you do this, these uh, uh, mosaics won't last, but you know, it has been there for 25 years and they're very, very strong. Nothing has happened to them. So don't let people, pessimistic people, discourage you from ex executing your ideas if you really believe in them. Go ahead. Next one. Uh, I want to tell you that even when it came to amphitheater, which usually is, is separated from the rest of the continuous architecture, <clears throat> I declined to do that. I said, it has to be part of the continuous architecture. As you walk, you should see it. And this amphitheater holds a lot of functions right now. Go ahead. And this is in front of the portal of your light in the future would be uh, the performing arts center, which is not built right now, but it's already designed. <clears throat> this is the new uh, addition, uh, which was inaugurated in 2018. Uh, more high-tech laboratories and classrooms, and the design is complete right now. Go ahead. Go ahead. Next. How about the, uh, are you going to put the video? Yes, uh, now I will. All right, hold on, hold on a minute. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on, okay. Uh, you, do you see the coach Maidan? You see the portal of light leading the, to the coach Maidan? To your right, this is the student center. All of the buildings in the right. Yes, this is student center. And put your cursor on the tower, please. And on the ne building next to it. Yes, okay. This is another example of form evokes function. I added this to the program and the representative of the client initially objected. He said, it's not in the program, it costs a lot of money. And I said, but I want it. And the good thing is that Rami Bey evidently had told them that whatever I designed should be built. So this coach university, the coach family was the best client I have ever had in my entire 40 year of career. They were really quite responsive to what I felt would be appropriate. So we built this. It didn't have any function, but it has turned out now that this building that for which next to the tower for which there was no function has become the foundation hall and the most popular and the most used and the most endeared 
space in the university. So it found its own function. So form does evoke function. And the top of that uh, tower also has become a very favorite coffee shop that people go and drink coffee and gap. Next one. Oh, oh, oh. I also want to mention something else to you. Hold on, hold on. Next one, show, show the next page, the next one. The next image, the next image you just showed. All right, okay, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, uh, Neil Hanum, put your cursor on that crack between the library and the, and the other building, yes. Now, there is a walk from here that goes throughout all of the courtyards of the campus. I mentioned to Rami Bey, you know, he has fantastic antique collection and a lot of them are in his island uh, that he owns. And when I visited him in his island and saw all of that fantastic collection and his museum uh, in which uh, he has a lot of uh, antique objects coming all the way to the modern time industrial age, I said, Rami Bey, it would be great to have a memory walk in this campus so that when the students walk from on these, through these courtyards, they see all of these samples of the glory of Turkey from Hittite times to the modern times. And he agreed, he immediately agreed. And he, all of these walls of these courtyards are filled with antique times from, you know, uh, uh, Roman, Greek, Hellenistic, all the way to the modern uh, items of industrial objects in this uh, courtyard of the School of Engineering, uh, and they change it so that when the students walk through this campus, they get an education. Not only they become, by looking at the architecture, proud of their Turkish identity uh, and the concept of the Orient of Light, but they also become familiar with the antique uh, remains of their past. I also asked them to hire Ara Güler, the famous uh, photographer in Turkey. And there is a wall next to the uh, theater we have designed for the university, which is very long uh, to put pictures showing the glory of Turkey from Hittite times to modern times. And I have asked uh, uh, Omran Inan Bey to also put quotes on the opposite wall about all of the important Turkish figures, literary, scientific, etc., put quotes from them on this wall across it, which I hope is in the process of being done. All right, next one. You see that in all of these courtyards on the walls, you see the antiques. If you go there, you will see it. And in the School of Engineering, which is the last courtyard, you see industrial objects. Uh, I have to tell you, the only part I'm not very happy with is, hold on, are the, this is the dormitories for the student on the other side of the academic campus. Because I sketched one of them and before I knew it was built, I said, look, we haven't even finished the design. I went to Suna Hanum. Suna Hanum Karach is one of the greatest ladies I have ever met. He uh, unfortunately passed away recently and his place is in the, uh, with the angels in the heaven. He was a mag she was a magnificent woman. And she told me, she said, Mojambe, I have to, to build this because if I don't build it, the land would be compromised. So, you know, they duplicated 19 times, but fortunately in the latest design I have given for another 500 students, graduate and uh, PhD and master's student, I was able to uh, give a design for integrated continuous architecture, which is going to be built on the far end of the residential campus. Okay, let's continue. Okay, hold on, hold on here. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. This is all the student center. And the 
most difficult design for me was designing of this student center. And let me tell you, uh, students, of course, what we did, we pretty much did the same thing we did at the university, American University in Cairo. We put the library at one end and the student center in one end uh, to create a lot of traffic in the coach Maidan, but also we took some aspects of the student center, put it in different courtyards. All of these courtyards have restaurants. So the eating facility of the student center is dispersed throughout all of the courtyards. And uh, we have 25 cafeterias and restaurants in this complex. Uh, but could you go uh, move, move the, go on please, uh, Neil Hanna, go on, go on. Show me more, more, more. Okay. You see how the amphitheater is integrated. <laughs> Go ahead, more. Okay, do you see how the, okay. Okay, hold on. This is going, this is the entrance to the theater. And on the other side, when you come out of the theater, this is the wall where Ara Giller has put his paintings. Go ahead. Okay. These courtyards are all connected with each other by entrance portals and the walls of them are full of antiques. Parking is outside. Okay, could you hold on here? Could you hold, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Could you put your cursor on the student center? The student center on this side is small and the entrance is across from the entrance of the library. From the other side, you saw how big it was because it goes down the hill. For three, four stories, it goes down the hill. It was very difficult for me to design this. We changed the design many times because my idea was that when you enter upon the student center, you have to understand the whole complex and all of the activities of the students should emerge in front of your eyes. You should not enter into a dead lobby and then go to different rooms. We tried many times to many with many sketches and I was not happy with it. Then I remembered when I was a student um, and I was studying the first year of architecture at the University of Tehran, our professor gave us a project uh, which was called Royal Staircase. And we never knew what he meant, but he actually said what he was he had in mind was the Royal Staircase of the Vatican Palace. And then when I saw the, uh, when I was in Rome and I saw it, I understood what he meant. It's a magnificent staircase, which, you know, lots of people can walk up and down, but every landing of the staircase becomes a floor. So I thought to myself, wow, that is what we should do. We should have a staircase, a magnificent staircase that would be the center of student activity and every floor becomes a, every landing becomes a floor and I would be able to see it the moment I enter the student center. I would show this to you later, but let's finish these uh, videos now, okay? Go on. You see, look, 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 uh, on the Bosphorus Terrace, as you walk, every courtyard has a mini entrance portal. Do you see the connection between the two buildings? And I have a lot of, yeah, that, yeah. You, you can see the rising sun from every one of them. And in here, I have these little pavilions that I put on, on the way, it's inspired by your, by the, uh, uh, historic Turkish architecture. And when I go there, a lot of students are holding outdoor classes in these pavilions. Under each uh, 
uh, under each arch, there are places for students to sit and enjoy conversation. Remember, the experience of college is not looking at sensational buildings. When you leave your college education, what remember, you remember and what is, in dear, uh, is dear to you is the little bench you sat on next to a fountain or a reflecting pool or a little pavilion and you fell in love. And that is what is endearing memory of university education or the magnificent discussion you had with a close friend. These are what you remember, and this is what prompts you to donate to your most favorite institution of learning. Go ahead, please. Now, one thing you have to remember, the upper windows, could you point out to the upper windows, upper windows. The upper windows of this entire complex of 300,000 square meter is the same. This is the unifying element that ties everything together. And these are the opportunities that the American University of Cairo, the one who was put in charge of the execution of the project because of self-interest and giving the project to a lot of his friends and associates and maybe benefiting from it financially, I don't know, uh, deprived the American University in Cairo does not have the harmony of design that Coach University has. Yes, please move. Because th these are the dormitories I mentioned to you about them. Uh, which are on the other side, and they're separated, unfortunately. You can go through this fast, uh, uh, Neil Hanum. Has the same kind of architecture, but the connectivity is lost there in, this, in, uh, in the student faculty housing. Of course, we also did the uh, professor faculty housing also, also and the professors how the president's house, that building at the far end is a coach facility. I mean, that building in the far end is sports facility. We have also designed the expansion of sports facility. Uh, put your finger, put your cursor on where the auditorium is going to be. Auditorium is going to be built here. Uh, in front of it, there's going to be a semicircle, which we call uh, arrival crescent where buses are going to stand there and people would wait there uh, and it's designed in the form of crescent to recall the Turkish symbol of half moon. Yes. The next video please. The next video that the, the next video can go very fast. I just want them to see how big the campus has gotten now. I just want you to put your cursor on the on the very end and show this uh, new complex that was uh, that was built in 2018 uh, and was dedicated with the dedication ceremony of the campus uh, celebrating its 25th anniversary. And you see how this is also connected to the rest. The reason it's in this shape is that in front of it was a mound with a lot of trees on it and we did not want to destroy the trees. So the, the architecture got this particular form and the building at the far end with the uh, kind of curvilinear dome that's the sports facility next to it or is going to be an expansion to it um, which would connect it to the rest of the campus and that's all designed and waiting to be built okay you can go very quickly through this please i don't want to spend much time on it
the left student center. Everything to the left is the student center. See how vast it is. And I would show you some pictures of how we designed it later. Uh, hold on, hold on here, hold on. Do you see this vast green space and all of those amphitheater kind of seating that is rectangular? That is where we designed, and it wasn't in the program. Uh, across from the portal of light, there is going to be the auditorium, the new 2000 seat auditorium for performing arts. It is designed in a very sophisticated way. You can hold uh, operas there. And on the other, on the front uh, is going to be the entry crescent. And next to the sports facility is going to be the expansion of sports facility. And underneath all of that is a parking garage for 400, 500 cars. That's, these are not built yet. Go ahead. Do you want to show the, the pictures I just sent you about student center so I explain the concept of student center to them? So my idea was I wanted to develop a grand staircase where all the student activities occur. It emerges from the coach maidan and it goes three, four floors down. And each floor becomes, each landing becomes a floor so that when you enter, you understand, you comprehend the design idea behind the student center. Uh, and I have more pictures. See, on this upper floor, left is a Susie's Cafe. The light is an, the right is another place where they buy things. The far end is the bookstore. And then as you come down on the first level, you have all of the cafe uh, of the uh, stands for eating food and buying things. When you go further down, you have the main cafeteria of the campus and you understand the whole thing. If you go there right now, this was taken last night, I believe, or yesterday. There's, there's nobody in, this, uh, in the campus right now, but it's filled with students. A lot of conversation, a lot of interaction happens on this stair. You see how every landing becomes a floor connected to each other. So the entire, you comprehend the entire design concept of the university, that this is all about interaction and discussion and about uh, getting ideas in your mind. It's about the orient of light, which is the emergence of intellectual ideas in your mind and inter interchange of it with students and faculty and coming up with a new spark of a uh, new idea. Yes? Okay. If you have a chance, go and visit that campus. Uh, we have the Aohan University now. I can go very quickly through it, Elefanum, if you want me to. Yes, please. Okay. The Aohan University, uh, this is uh, one of my initial works uh, related to the concept of continuous architecture. The Ahan, I don't know how many of you know him. He is one of the richest men in the world, and he is the Imam of the Ismaili um, uh, sect of Islam. Uh, uh, he's a very enlightened man. He has done wonderful things. He wanted to design a university 
with a very unique and specific idea in mind that it has to reflect their, the culture of the area and of, uh, uh, of his uh, belief. And he sent a group of people all over the world to find the architect. At that time, I was the chief of design and the principal in charge at, uh, at Perkins and Will. When he came there, I, they interviewed me and I told them about my idea and I wrote it in a short paper and sent it to the Aga Khan. And the Aga Khan, when he saw that, it, my ideas was pretty much what I'm telling you. In fact, those blocks that I showed you at the beginning were the blocks that I prepared to convey my thought to him. Uh, those are very old blocks. Uh, he immediately said that he would not want anybody else except Mujan Kadem uh, to be uh, the uh, leader of the design team. And since I had a friend by the name of Payet and Payet Associates who had done some hospitals, we collaborated with each other and finished this project. Now, uh, on the right, you see the entrance portal of the Al Khan University. Uh, show me the pictures. The master plan of it was conceived on this idea. At that time, you would never design a master plan for it was, it started as a hospital and medical education facility uh, like this. It was unheard of. It was a series of courtyards that are connected to each other. Usually at that time, they would build a tower and they would put diagnostic and treatment in the bottom of it. And the rest of it would be the hospital and one floor would be dedicated to medical students and so on. But this is what we designed and he immediately liked it. And it was built, it, uh, it met with a lot of skepticism as to whether this function is going to work or not. Uh, I have shown here only mainly the open spaces and the courtyards, but it's really continuous architecture. Everything is connected to each other. And on the very top is the school of nursing. Uh, now, these courtyards that we have here, they are not just done for beauty's sake. They have function. Uh, this is where the interaction is. This has become the, uh, the waiting area. And this is uh, another space in the, in the VIP wing of the hospital. And this is the passage for the students who study medicine. Now, I'm showing this to show you how we can be inspired from the past so that architecture has a memory. I mentioned to you, it has to have the memory of the past. This is the past examples. And this is the, mo okay. This is the modern rendition of the portal that connects these uh, open spaces and courtyards together. I even have put some calligraphy around the edge of this entrance, which recalls the calligraphy of the past. You have to remember this surface treatment uh, makes it possible for the visitors and the viewers to communicate with the building. Those who can read these things can read them and they can, it can even entice their memory to go to their past literary works like Attar, like Hafiz, like uh, uh, Mevlana and so on and have a communication, have a dialogue with the facility. So a building should talk to you. Building is a living thing, represents um, your innermost uh, um, cultural feelings and represents the idea behind the design. Uh, do you see the entrance to uh, the entrance gate at the very end of this design? I have something to say to you about that. Go ahead. Next one. Oh, uh, I have to tell you, um, the, this entrance, the gate at the very end, could you put your cursor on that? Uh, Neil Hano, yes, the, on the entrance, on the entrance, the, down, down, yes, yes, yes. That is a decorative gate, which uh, the decoration of the gate is composed of calligraphic uh, sentences, um, which, as I said to you, 
should say something to the user. When they go there, they should be able to read it. If they can, they should try to read it. And that engages them with the building in a dialectical manner. Uh, there were 35 of them. And uh, I had said that they should be made in bronze. The client's representative was not happy with me because they said they don't have the budget. I said, well, make it in aluminum. They said, no, we want you to state it should be in aluminum. And I told them I would never say that. If you want it, you can make it in aluminum and we'll do it for you. Uh, and they, they made me go back to Pakistan, to Karachi five times to convince me it should be in aluminum. I said, look, make it in aluminum. It's okay with me. But I would not say, I say it should be in bronze. So finally, they asked the other Khan, uh, I said, ask the Alcon. The Alcon turned around and said, Mujan is right. But since there are 35 of them and the budget is limited, have him make fun of five of the most important ones in bronze. And that's what we did. Now go ahead, show me the other pictures. Uh, we did the same thing with the other things in the, uh, in the facility. The uh, image above the door here, I was studying at TARS, the conference of the bird at that time, and that inspired me to do that image. And there are elements in there that if somebody looks at it, can recall the story of at TARS, the conference of the birds, uh, and have a dialogue with the building. Uh, so the building has to engage you in more than one way. Uh, the auditorium is uh, uh, where a lot of the smiley symbolism is embedded there. I designed them especially to make them recall their uh, um, theological ideas. Yes, next one. No, go ahead, go back, go back, please. I want to go back to the gates, to the gates. Yes, all right. Go back to the next gate. Okay, so this is the design of the gate that you put in the 30, very, very simple austere entrances and all of a sudden you have this ornate gate. Uh, 35 of them is in bronze. And I ask you, do you know why the Awakhan agreed with me and why I insisted on the bronze gate? Can I see the face of the audience? Maybe somebody can tell me why. Do you know why? Anybody venture to say why? I wouldn't give up. Even the construction manager who was an Englishman by the name of Brian Carlyle came to my hospital when I was at an operation. I said, Brian, you didn't come to my deathbed because you're sorry, you want to give your condolences. Uh, you have come to get a signature from me that the gates should be in aluminum and I will never give it to you. You are a patriotic Englishman, aren't you? He said, yes. I said, these gates will wind up in British Museum. Sometimes in the future, do you want them in bronze or in aluminum? And he shut up and he left. <laughs> now I tell you, since nobody can guess, I said it should be in bronze because the Aga Khan considers himself as the latest Imam of the Ismailis. He's, he considers himself the inheritor of the Fatimi dynasty of Egypt. And a thousand years ago, what did the Fatimi Imam in Egypt do? He built the Al-Azhar University, which is to this day, the most important theological seminary in the Islamic world. So after a thousand years, a new Imam is building a new university, not in Cairo, this time in Karachi. What should be the gates? bronze or aluminum. Now you tell me, they should be in gold actually, because he's doing a very historic uh, act. So therefore this again comes to the idea of the presence of the past, that history is repeated. So this is what I had to tell you about my philosophy of architecture and what has, what has prompted me to do these buildings. I encourage you all to think about your definition. What is your definition of architecture? And if you become convinced about it, uh, pursue it. 
and build your career upon that, but not on sensationalist pieces that adorns the magazines these days. I am not saying there are some exceptional sensationalist pieces that should be built, but the majority of architecture uh, should not reflect the idiosyncrasies of the architect or the artist or the novelist. It should be conveyed in a very transparent way so that the idea behind it shines through. And that is when you have great works of art. Thank you very much. So thank you, Mr. Moshan. Uh, thank you for uh, sharing your design philosophy, your uh, design projects, and uh, your time again. It's, it was really a great pleasure for us uh, to host you. Now I think we can start our Q&A session. Uh, who wants to ask a question? Is there any? No one. So come on, you have to design a student center project and you should yes. have some questions, I think. I need to get a feedback from you. I don't want to <laughs> yeah. I ask one question. Uh, have you uh, seen our campus? And if you have, what do you think about it? No, I haven't been to your campus, but Aleph Hanum has promised me when this COVID issue is over, we will have a date at Koch University and a date at your campus. Yeah, we are waiting for you to come. Hope, hopefully in the very near soon. But, you know, I encourage you dear students or the faculty members, if you disagree with me, let me know because that is this is the way I, I mentioned to you. The most important thing is the in the public space is the uh, uh, when ideas clash with each other and the truth comes out of the clashing of ideas. So consider me as a challenge to clash your ideas against me and we come up with a better truth. Uh, hello again. Yeah. Uh, I don't uh, have a specific question, but I can uh, say that I don't disagree with you about the uh, first things we discuss about architecture, about the meaning and the knowledge. So you uh, said something near, uh, nearly like um, it's the body of the knowledge. It it appears us like a body. It has a construction, but I, I still uh, think about the words you said about the form and the function. I think they uh, should be more equal when we try to design something. I think, uh, for example, uh, think of it uh, like there's a part and uh, on this part, uh, like we don't uh, go to the design. We we try to find it in the center of the path. And one way is coming from the function and one way is coming from the form. So I don't- I am sorry, that... my, my microphone is not very good. You have to speak louder for me to hear you. Ah, louder. Okay, so I was talking about uh, the design, uh, the designing process. So I don't think that uh, we should separate the function and the form on, uh, there is no hierarchy uh, between them uh, and uh, they have to be equal to me while I design something because they have the, uh, they have the equal meaning. I mean, okay, so uh, I said that there was a path, but this path is not going to the design. It uh, is meeting uh, in the center and the center is uh, where we uh, design something as, and then it's perfect. But it's never perfect because uh, we don't uh, we we can't do that. <laughs> but one way is coming from the form, and I, one way is coming from the function, and they meet in the center. One is coming opinion. from function, and one is coming from where? Form. Uh, the form. 
One is coming from function and one is coming from where, did you say? Uh, the form, form, she said. The form. Yeah. <laughs> yes. They are but equal. The form is very important. The function is very important to make the form. But what I was saying is to become a slave of that, we are making forms then that after a few years, they become obsolete because the function changes all the time. And a lot of times we don't have to completely follow the form. Look at how many buildings have become obsolete because they were function specific and over a period of time, they have lost their usefulness. You have to assign new function to it. So sometimes if you are inspired to do a design or something in a campus or anywhere that you cannot assign a specific function, but inwardly in your guts, you feel it makes it more beautiful, just do it. It will find its function. That's what I was saying. Am I clear or did I understand what you were saying? So there is a message in the chat box. Uh, one of our students wrote, uh, that was really inspiring. Thank you, Mr. Hadem. There is an issue with my microphone and webcam. I would like to greet you, but I'm sorry for it. I am very inspired and ask, how could you be so humble? What do you mean humble? <laughs> I, well, look, look, I am just, one of the many, many architects in the world. And this is the way I look at the architecture. Other people may look at it differently and their value, their view is, uh, uh, is uh, can be valid for them. And they, you know, they may come up with some other ways of looking at architecture. But I think each one of us should search within our inner being and uh, decide how we want to develop our career, you know. And this is, the way I felt I want to develop it. I really don't consider architecture any more than any other profession, any different. It's design is the skin of a living thought. Like my word is the skin of a living thought. And I have to find out what that living thought was. At the American, at the Coach University, the living thought was the orient of light, the dawn of knowledge, of un the knowledge of understanding, as symbolized in the Coach Maidan. One of the first things Umran Bey, the new president, asked me is why the Coach Maidan is not completely uh, rectangular. That one of the, that the student center has an angle, tilts away from the 90 degrees, more than 90 degree. And my immediate response to him was in deference to the to the rising sun, to pay respect to the rising sun, but also it had another explanation. When you do that, the coach Maidan looks a lot vaster when it looks at the east. But, you know, thank you very much for your compliment on the first chat. Uh, can I ask one more question? Uh... Yes, please. Uh, I have been to Koch University several times before, and when I was there, I saw that uh, you used some design elements uh, from Turkish classical architecture. How can you take some uh, images from past and still make your design contemporary? Excuse me, say that again, please. You take some uh, images, design elements from uh, classic Turkish architecture and yes. apply it to your own and still make your design uh, very contemporary. How can you make that? Well, I don't know what you mean by contemporary. We did not copy anything exactly the way it was in the past, uh, but I studied a lot of the architecture uh, in Turkey, a lot of architectural monuments in Turkey. And the one I was very impressed with was the Bayezid Kulliye near Aderne. If you go there, I, I thought that was magnificent. I used the ideas of the courtyards. I studied Topkapi very much. And the chimneys in the Koch University 
are inspired by the chimneys in Topkapi Palace. Uh, uh, when you go to Koch University, it definitely looks like a building that should belong to Turkey, not only to Turkey, to Istanbul, not only to Istanbul, to the Bosphorus region of Istanbul. We studied a lot of the Yale's in Istanbul and we did not copy any one of them, but we tried to get inspired by them so that when the student is on that campus, he feels that he is, his home is beautiful. Because you see, in my opinion, architects have a role in modern society. Uh, the object of modern society is the unity of mankind and world peace. If you transport foreign artistic ideas and impose it on a culture that is not familiar with that ideas, you increase their alienation. Architects have to become agent of unity and peace. And by trying to make sure that their architectural, uh, the, the, the pieces of architecture they produce tells the user that your culture is beautiful. Like my culture is beautiful in America, yours is beautiful too. That brings unity and understanding. At the same time, I think if we copy the past, we become dead. We cannot copy the past. We should be inspired by the past. And the past should be present. Like the past is present in your being. The, your being is the presence of the past of all of your ancestors. But if you stop there and don't try to progress, you become a fundamentalist. You have to develop the potentialities of your future in your own being. And I kind of think architecture has to, architecture has to do that. We did the same thing with the portal of the Aachen University. We didn't uh, copy the arches of the past as a portal, but we tried to infuse in it a sense of memory. Now, it is you wonderful students have to tell me whether I have been able to accomplish this in the three important campuses I showed to you or not. I, all I can tell you is that I have tried without copying the past. And I think you did very well. What did you say? And I think you did your job very well. Thank you very much, Belgian Bay. And if you have any criticism, tell me, I don't mind it. And uh, I think, um, I'm sorry. I think that uh, there is a great uh, mathematics behind your design. Uh, I could to Hanum, could you speak louder because I can't understand what you yes. said. Okay, so I think that there is a great mathematics behind your design. That was my sentence. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I we, we did a lot of research. I tell you, this method of designing takes twice as much work as traditional methods of designing. And, you know, many offices cannot afford to do it. But since my office had very little overhead, we did it. There is a second chat. I don't know what the second chat said. Let me read it. Uh, the way you are talking and thinking is inspiring. And Mr. Hadem? Your whole vision on the subject is really humble. May I ask, is there any core advice you can give to a senior architect at the beginning of her or his way? Uh, yes, I can see the face of the wonderful lady who talked. Uh, <laughs> it was me, but I was reading the uh, chat box. Oh, you read the, you read the ch chat box, yes. Yeah. yes. Uh, uh, my advice to the architects is that to do soul searching and find out and decide, decide for themselves what is architecture and why are they in this field? Uh, 
you know, because if you decide what it is and why you are there, you get fired up with the fire of love. You know, without love, we cannot accomplish anything in this world. Intellect alone would not accomplish anything. And I have to tell you, when intellect develops to its highest level, it becomes love. There is no difference between intellect at its highest level. Because intellect, when you develop your intellect to its highest level, it becomes uh, intoxicated intellect. Intoxicated intellect is the same as love. And without that force of love, nothing can be accomplished in this world. Without that force of love, I could not have inspired the people who worked with me to work for 25 years realizing this concept of the Oriental of light in Coach University. Or what we did at the uh, American University in Cairo. That motivates you. It's that force of love that motivated Einstein to develop the theory of real relativity. It is the force of love that motivated Mevlana to produce the most magnificent um, uh, Gnostic literature in the entire world. So my recommendation to you is deep, search deep down in your being and see what is what does architecture mean to you and are you in love with the idea behind architecture not with some sensationalist form that you make out of the figment of your imagination if you find you're in love with that pursue it that is the field that is ascribed for you uh, by your uh, what is uh, embedded in your real reality and don't become victim to a lot of slogans like less is more or form follows function and so on. Develop your own slogans based on your own concept and theory of what architecture is. Did I answer you, dear lady? I have a third chat, third comment. <laughs> Can't see the third one. Thank you very much, she, uh, she wrote. Uh, she thank you. So is there any other question? Hi. Um, hi. Can I ask something? Yes. Can you hear me? Ah, OK. Uh, at first, I want to say something like thank you. Uh, you know, uh, we are, uh, as we are young future architects, we are always trying to catching up the developments, international developments, and sometimes we are getting away from our own culture. And thanks for reminding us, we always need to keep it in mind. Uh, we sometimes avoid the heritage of those cultures which users have. And thanks for reminding us, we need to keep it in mind all the time. And uh, my question is like, uh, I want to ask your opinion about something as a follow-up questions for my friends, Berker's question. Um, we are designing a student center in our uh, campus, but in an existing campus. And uh, what will be your recommendation? Uh, like, uh, should it be that building, should it be a whole different design or should be in a great harmony with the existing buildings or how uh, we can um, match them? What will be your opinion about it? Well, I haven't seen your campus uh, and I don't know the overall design philosophy of your campus, but when it comes to student center, student center is the center of the activity of the students and faculty and visitors. So you have to design it in a way that it encourages maximum interaction uh, between students, provides a little campus, like I mentioned, um, make sure that all of the spaces are interrelated and there are, um, Sp fun spaces for introspection as well as interaction, you know. 
If people want to get there privately, there are places for them to do it. And above all, when you enter in the building, you are inspired by understanding what the whole concept was about this design. Uh, don't separate the parts together. I showed it, I showed to you how on this very difficult site, Coach University, again, one of the interesting things about Coach University is that it's completely wedded and it's uh, integrated with its hilly landscape. We never try to impose ourselves on the landscape. When you enter upon the student center you design, one has to understand the concept behind it. What is your concept behind it? Is to have a lot of separated elegant rooms or the concept behind it is to say, this is the center of learning and this is where all the students come to interact and develop their intellectual ideas further by the fact that they are going to come in contact with each other and their ideas by the, by the contact of, of their ideas, the spark of new ideas and illumination would appear. I think, think very deeply about what the student center is all about, and especially on that campus. Uh, I think if an architect winds up designing two different buildings for two different places and two different cultures, and they look the same, and it carries the signature of the architect rather than the signature of that place and culture, that building has, is a failure in architecture, in my opinion. Every new pieces of architecture has to be different and unique and one of a kind. Like every one of you is one of a kind. There are no two uh, similar human, two human beings that look the same and are the same. We are all different. The beauty of the world is, is in its unity in diversity. And I think the works of architecture that you produce in the future, in my opinion, if they are diverse, that's great. I, I don't mind seeing a, a building by Frank Gehry, you know, he has, he's very creative. But if we have, if all of us try to do a building and the next building has carries the same signature and we do a gimmick and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it, that's not architecture. That is, uh, the shell of the idea, the skin of the idea that has become so thick that doesn't let anybody see anything except that egocentric architect. Yeah, that was a really clear answer. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. There is a fourth comment, Elefano. Fourth one. Let me check. Uh, she said, hello, I'd like to ask something, but have some problems about camera. I cannot read more. Hello. Yeah. Ah, okay. The voice is okay. Um, uh, firstly, uh, I'm really pleased to meet you and thank you for your presentation. Could you hear me? Yes, yeah, I can, I can hear, you. hear you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I, I actually wondering about the background of your designs uh, is full of powerful thoughts, uh, especially the oriental effect uh, can be observed in many parts of your works. And uh, your philosophy is very inspiring. And at the other hand, the project you have done uh, are very large scale and contain uh, many functions. And you also mentioned the form not always follows the function. You said form invokes the function. Uh, what I'm wondering is how do you synthesize all these ideas? Where do you start from? Where do you start designing? Uh, I can hear you clearly, but I didn't quite completely understand uh, the issue you're making. Are you saying <coughs> you had issue with my saying form evokes function? Yes, you mentioned about the, uh, you, you said about many things, your uh, ideas about the function 
and your thoughts about the um, lights and oriental effect of your project. I'm wondering if, uh, where, where do you start from? Where do you start designing? All these full of the backup back, background of your designs. There are many powerful thoughts. So how can you synthesize, synthesize all of these things? Well, as I mentioned to you, uh, one reason I started working at Perkins and Will when I graduated was that they were designing universities. And I thought my idea of continuous architecture can be accomplished by designing big projects. You know, you can't do it if you're designing a single house, you know. Of course, you can do that to, uh, to some extent. Um, but once, once I developed these ideas, it became important to me before I started a project, I find out that project is from what client and for what country and for what kind of a nature is it hilly nature? Is it flat nature? Is it forest? Is it whatever? And then I, uh, I had to look into the background of that region or that culture to look at the, its historic background, its uh, literary background, its architectural background, its artistic background. And I call all of these morphic fields of architecture. Morphic means shapes. This, the, sh the field of shapes of architecture, uh, both intellectual and physical shapes, artwork, sculpture, poetry, music, etc. Of course, I can't become uh, well versed in all of them, but I can develop enough respect for them to try to understand them and don't take the attitude of superiority and cultural chauvinism because I came from Boston or I came from the United States, you know. Uh, and then after that, uh, considering this idea of continuous architecture, I would take the program and deconstruct it, and deconstruct it into spaces that I can, into, into units or rooms that I can put around the spaces that I conceive for that kind of architecture. And then informed by the morphic field of architecture, you know, after trials, you know, my design team were, were very well versed in this sort of a thing. And once I give the hint, hint, they start producing it. And the ones who are not in agreement with me, they can't work with me because that's the way I think about architecture. Now, you may wind up thinking a different way about architecture and that's fine. And then develop people around yourself who are in agreement with you and you can together achieve great things. Did I answer you or didn't I? Yes, 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 thank you so much. For me, everything is architecture in the world. Everything is architecture, as I mentioned to you. Even when I talk, my speech is the architecture of my thoughts. But by the same virtue, it's the skin of my thought. It doesn't convey my thought. How many times have you said to some of your friends, you know, my God, I don't know how to put these in words. That means the meaning that is in your mind is much higher and it's sublime. You're using the words to convey it only, but the moment you utter the word, the beauty of that meaning is less than what is in your mind. You can never completely convey the entire meaning by words. That's why uh, Rumi has said, I would want to destroy the murmur of sound syllable and words and communicate with you without it. Or when Rumi has a fantastic poem and it applies to architecture, he says, he says, Khoshk, Simo Khoshk, Chubo Khoshk, Pust, as Kujami Ayadin Awayadust. He says, dry skin, dry wood, dry wood dry stone, dry skin, where from comes the sound of the king? Or where from comes the music of the king? The music of the king, 
that is the idea. The beauty of the idea is the music of the king, which manifests itself in the form of dry stone, dry wood, and dry material of architecture. He says, where does it come from? It is the music of the king. It's the music of the beauty of the idea behind the appearance in architecture that we have to look for and make the skin of design so thin that it shows itself. If you look at a piece of art and you don't become overwhelmed by joy to the point that you have tears in your eyes, it is not a masterpiece. Masterpiece is the shining through of the idea through the skin of the words and of the forms. Uh, am I confusing everybody by, by these talks or not? No, I think not. So is there any comment or any question? Actually, uh, I have a question again. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so my question is, um, you have mentioned uh, about the failure of failure of architecture. So what happens? I'm, I mean, I wonder what would you do uh, if you had to design uh, in a context full of uh, failure of architecture? If I had to design in what? <laughs> in a context uh, full of failure of architecture. Not a, by nature, because it's not another problem. But when a human, uh, a human being uh, tries to um, create something, uh, it could be a failure. You said. So what would happen in a context well, like that? I mean, I can I consider. Uh, let me see if I understand your question. You are saying, how would I design if I have to? design something that is a failure? No, no. In a context, uh, I mean, um, the environment is the like built, a The built environment, failure. you mean, AJ, sorry to interrupt, but you mean the yes, built yes, environment? Yes, 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 of course. What, what did you say? Please repeat um, that. Okay, so uh, I mean the context, uh, like it's the uh, built environment. A what? Like what a humans built. Like what? Like, uh, for example, a city, uh, but I mean, uh, it's the built environment. The buildings, oh, in, in the, the build architecture. In the built environment, if I have to do a new building? Yes, yes, yes. But when you find it uh, as a failure of, of architecture, so uh, how could you relate to that? Uh, if I build in a place where there is a lot of failure of architecture, how can I design, yes. right? <laughs> yes. Well, yes. For example. well, you know, uh, in my opinion, a lot of the buildings that are built, uh, they may perform the function, they would be okay. But as far as I am concerned in terms of conveying the idea behind it, in a lot of them, I don't see a real idea behind it. They're just buildings. They're just buildings. They don't carry the song of the king. But if I am given a project to do, I do my very best. I, who am I to say that the modern architects have failed? In my opinion, they have failed, but maybe they haven't. According to somebody else's opinion, they haven't failed. But if, I give it, if I'm given, for example, to build a hospital, which I have been given to. For instance, in Cleveland, I had a project, it wasn't, it was big, but not as big as these universities I showed to you. Uh, it was a, um, uh, intensive care center for the University Hospitals of Cleveland. And it was, a, it's, it's a very significant building. Well, what I did, I looked at it, there were a lot of, it, the campus was a chaos to begin with. So I thought that my architecture should bring a focus to that campus, uh, 
and the campus did not have any sense of welcoming or entry. So I designed that facility with a, a very interesting landscape element in front of it to look, and it was looking at the major uh, street in Cleveland, Ohio, to indicate that yes, I am the entrance of this magnificent institution of learning and you are welcome, come in. The idea of welcome became important to me, to welcome them to a very important institution of learning. You can see that on my website. Or when I was given uh, Herkut Sylvester, who was a, uh, is a philanthropist and a very rich man in Miami, wanted to uh, build a comprehensive cancer center at the University of Miami. And I went for interview there. And in the interview, believe me, when I go to my interviews, I before I go, I take 10 minutes and I tell my friends to leave me alone. And I recite to myself the poems of Mevlana. And I get fired up and I go to the meeting. And invariably, I also quote from Mevlana in this Western world uh, that doesn't really understand him very well. And then after I was done, I said a lot of things I told you now, not all of them, some of them. And then afterwards, I heard Helcott Sylvester said, I would not, many architects came for interview. He said, I wouldn't give the project to anybody but Mujan Kadem. And but what I did on that one, that would be a very interesting topic for discussion, that particular project of mine. Because what I did, I looked at the campus of the Uni University of Miami Medical School. It was a chaos. That campus was full of these buildings that you're talking about that I thought were failures. The building itself functioned okay, but around it, there were cars, there were confusion. There was no sense of unity to the campus. And I decided what this campus needs is a sense of unity. And that was the main idea behind it. But a sense of unity that is going to be uniquely uh, 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 Miami Beach, not Turkey, not uh, Cairo. So what I did was that I developed a design. It is continuous architecture, but on a much smaller scale, much smaller scale, that focused on developing a main spe space for the interaction of the students, as well as all of the cancer patients who come and all the visitors of the cancer patient uh, and surrounded it. On the other side, somebody else came, uh, Ronald McDonald said they want to put a residential development and you put it on the other side. And that university uh, for the first time has a, has a main space where people can get together, the doctors, students, faculty, visitors and exchange ideas. And another thing that on that campus became important for me was that since it was in an urban environment, a very dense urban environment, I insisted that each facade of the building should not necessarily copy the other facade. There are four facades, aren't there? And each facade reflects the requirement of the space that that facade faces onto. You see what I mean? Because on one of the facades, it was public transportation. And we designed that facade to relate to that uh, aspect of the urban environment. And the other facade that I had designed with, uh, uh, facing a major courtyard, the new courtyard of the university responded to that, was a lot more tranquil, places for people to come and sit under arches for contemplation. And so each side became different in design. And that's built right now. And I have a process model that conveys that idea very clearly for that building. So you can be, if you have a, very strong architectural idea, even in the mess of a lot of other buildings, you can express your thought in a way that would be meaningful. Uh, I remember after the building was dedicated, one of the doctors came and said, you know, it fills my heart with joy every time I enter into this building, because there I had, you know, Miami, uh, 
uh, Art Deco is a very important part of architecture in Miami, and every modern architects look at it, poo-poo it. But I celebrated it, and it says, it's great. Every time I come, I remember it looks like showing the rising sun. It greets me in the morning, and it's well, it forbade, it says goodbye to me in the afternoon. And that those kinds of comments are important for me. Did I answer you or not? You answered very well. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. So I think there's no question anymore. Uh, Mr. Mushan Hadem, uh, I really want to thank you so much for your inspirational speech. Uh, I'm sure it has really motivated our students. Uh, thank you for being us today. Thank you for your time. Uh, I really appreciate and thank you. And thank you for very much, Alafano, for inviting me. And I'd like to thank uh, uh, the Dean, uh, Dr. Kahraman, uh, as well as all of you wonderful students who participated. I wish a lot of you would attack me a lot more, but nobody attacked me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but uh, it was a pleasure to be with you and I hope someday I will have the uh, honor of meeting all, all of you and uh, conveying my thanks to Elif Hanum and to uh, Neil Hanum and to uh, Dr. Kahraman. Okay, thank you very much. Hope to see you soon in Istanbul. Uh, okay, then see you. Bye. We can